Good afternoon. Today is Monday the 20th of March 2023, just after one o'clock. Welcome to UK Column News. Your host today, Mike, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish, and we're delighted to be joined by Di David Scott, bringing us northern exposure from north of the border, and Mark Anderson joining us from the United States. Uh, well, David, uh, on Friday we were talking about Credit Suisse. Uh, even more has happened over the weekend, so uh, let's start off there. Yes, yeah, so we start off with the Financial Times and they're saying uh, the Swiss Central Bank offers Credit Suisse a liquidity backstop. Oh, that's good. Why ever would they need that? Well, the Financial Times goes on to explain, uh, well, there's, there, the investors are losing confidence in Credit Suisse and are selling off their stock. And we see here Credit Suisse, uh, one day share price change uh, down nearly 25%. That's pretty traumatic on, on anyone's uh, uh, books. Uh, and we see all the other European banks and the best of them is down 5%. So there are major sell-offs in stock price all across the European uh, financial sector, banking sector, which is evidence, of course, that the contagion has not stopped at Silicon Valley Bank. Um, now, Reuters also report this story. Um, Credit Suisse intends to borrow 50 billion uh, Swiss francs from the Swiss National Bank. And they go on to explain that uh, uh, there's, uh, the Swiss regulators have pledged liquidity lifeline to Credit Suisse in an unprecedented move by the central bank uh, after the flagship uh, Swiss lenders' shares fell by as much as 30% on Wednesday. Quote, Credit Suisse is taking decisive action to preemptively, this is an interesting definition of preemptive, by the way, after your share price falls 30%, but never mind, preemptively strengthen its liquidity uh, by intending to exercise its option to borrow, borrow from the Swiss National Bank up to 50 billion Swiss francs under a covered loan facility. It sounds so secure, covered loan facility, as well as a short-term liquidity facility, which are fully collateral, collateralized, collateralized by high-quality assets. What could be better? What could be stronger? What could be more Swiss and uh, reliable? Well, it's not quite like that. So uh, the next thing we're going to have a look at here is the condition of the Swiss National Bank that's making this 50 billion Swiss franc loan. Uh, we, the most up-to-date accounts we've got from them are from 2022. Um, and it transpired that in 2022, they lost 132 billion. The Swiss National Bank lost 132.5 billion Swiss francs in 2022 alone. And uh, we're highlighting that they would be going to lose, going to make further losses uh, going forward. Uh, and that obviously begs the question, how much cash do they have? So looking at their balance sheet, the most up-to-date one we could get was December 21. The total equity, so if you take all of the, the, the liabilities off their assets and what's left for sort of shareholders' equity in the Swiss National Bank, well, it was $204 billion, but you've got to subtract from that $132 billion, right? So you end up with $72 billion of which they're going, and that was that was in December, it will have got worse since then, of which they are going to lend either most or perhaps all to Credit Suisse to sort them out. So it does beg the question, who exactly is bailing out who and how much confidence we can have in all of this uh, banking shenanigans? And of course, we're not the only one to think this because <laughs> it got worse from there. Well, indeed it did. So then uh, on, uh, well, yesterday, uh, the uh, coordinated central bank action was announced uh, to enhance provision of US dollar liquidity because US dollar liquidity is the problem here. Uh, so the Bank of Canada, the Bank of England, the Bank of Japan, the European Central Bank, the Federal Reserve and the Swiss National Bank uh, announced a coordinated action to enhance the provision of liquidity via the standing US dollar liquidity swap line arrangements. Now, of course, there's no swap in this at all, despite what it says in the name, or at least the swap that might be happening comes later, if it ever comes at all. Uh, but basically, this is just more money printing. Uh, and uh, so that this was uh, consisting 
it, it starting with the Bank of England, we have to say, because the Bank of England would be the first to implement this, uh, consisting of seven day loans and using new standing US dollar swap lines. As I say, no swaps in this uh, as such. But then uh, once that announcement was made, basically more money printing, uh, then of course we had the announcement, David, that UBS was writing to the rescue. Uh, and well, if uh, the Silicon Valley Bank was bought for a pound by HSBC, buying Credit Suisse for a couple of billion really is about the same kind of levels of idiocy, really. Well, yeah, so here we've got Barnes reporting UBS rescues Credit Suisse with help from the Swiss National Bank, which, as we know, doesn't have all that much money. Um, so the report UBS down 5.5% at that point in the share price has agreed to buy Credit Suisse uh, with help from the Swiss National Bank, down 1.1%. Um, under the terms of the merger agreement, all shareholders of Credit Suisse, who are currently, the share price is currently down 58%, will receive one share in UBS for every 22.48 shares in Credit Suisse, putting the deal's price at around 3 billion Swiss francs. Now, if you delve into the state of Credit Suisse, they're currently saying the market capitalization is 7.33 billion Swiss francs. So if you're getting a company with a market capitalization of 7 billion for 3 billion, that sounds like a good deal, at least on the surface. Uh, and the Swiss government is providing 9 billion Swiss francs to backstop potential losses that UBS may take on the deal. So you've got... <laughs> You're paying three billion for a seven billion uh, Swiss franc company, but the government's bailing you out to the tune of another nine. How can you lose? Well, perhaps it's even worse than that because when news of this deal hit the markets, the first thing that happened was UBS shares dropped fourteen percent. So at least some people are not entirely convinced that this is a rock solid deal. It makes you wonder how bad the uh, liabilities within Credit Suisse really are. Uh, yeah, but we don't need to worry because UK banks are safe. Well, this is it. So the BBC are assuring us uh, the UK banking system is safe, in scare quotes, after Credit Suisse rescue. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> this, is, this is wonderful. I, I mean, they're not actually saying it's safe and effective, but, but they might as well be. So they're using the same language we saw during during the COVID rollout. It's all about safety and it's okay because it's safe. So they're using exactly the same words, the same language, the same manipulations to try and alter how the public think. Because of course, if the public think that the UK banks are not safe, that loss of confidence in its, it, it, it with nothing else actually happening, that loss of confidence alone would doom the UK banks to a catastrophic run. And, um, and, and an instant crisis. So they're playing a confidence game. They're playing essentially the reverse side of what they played during COVID, which was all about installing fear. Now they're trying to use the same words to install confidence. So David, a question for you, the, the BBC indicating that this could, of course, have a massive damaging effect on the UK economy. Who are the regulators that have been working round the clock in order to sort this problem out? Oh, that's the central banks, Brian. That's the Bank of England. And they're, they're experts. I mean, they, they know what they're doing. Um, I know what you're thinking. Well, they don't even know what causes inflation because they caused it and they didn't realise it was happening. And then they said it was transitory when it clearly wasn't. And, and I can understand how you might doubt their wisdom after that performance. But apparently, we're not meant to do that. Apparently, they say it's safe. And uh, the BBC can find nothing else to, um, to raise an, as an objection. Uh, well, it wasn't safe for $17 billion worth of bondholders. Uh, so here was uh, Reuters tweeting this out uh, yesterday uh, at 10.30 p.m. Credit Suisse write down, writes down $17 billion of bonds, uh, angering holders. Well, I'm sure it did anger them. Let's have a look at the statement from uh, the Swiss authorities. This is Finman, Finma, the uh, Swiss uh, uh, Financial Markets Supervisory Authority. Uh, they're the regulator in Switzerland anyway. Uh, and they said in their press release, in close coordination with FINMA, uh, the Swiss Confederation and the SNB, 
That's the Swiss National Bank. UBS will take over Credit Suisse in full. The extraordinary government support will trigger a complete write down of the nominal value of all 81 shares of Credit Suisse in the amount of around uh, 16 billion Swiss francs, is about $17 billion, uh, and thus an increase in core capital. Now, 81 bonds, for those who don't know, uh, these are also known as uh, contingent convertible bonds, or for short, COCOs, because they're a bit clownish. Uh, they were introduced after the financial crisis in 2007 as a way to transfer banking risk away from taxpayers and onto bondholders. Um, and uh, so they became very popular investment products uh, and money managers, banks, hedge funds and so on, including Credit Suisse, marketed these to clients as a safe way to uh, seek alpha, to boost, boost their yields and so on. Uh, well, it hasn't turned out to be terribly safe in this instance. And I don't imagine that it's going to be safe uh, in the future. Uh, who is it mainly exposed to this? Well, financial companies, uh, investment companies, hedge funds, banks themselves. So this potentially expands the contagion. Uh, well, we wait to see what the outcome is going to be. Uh, but Mark, uh, let's bring you in at this point. Uh, and of course, between this and the previous SVB failure, uh, more and more headlines talking about the Federal Reserve uh, and uh, their desire to see central bank digital currency. Yeah, uh, since last week's report, guys, it hit me when we first talked about SVB last week, it hit me, is it possible that uh, this will be ginned up or at least taken advantage of, or heaven forbid it could have been planned that way all along, whatever it might be, to uh, instill a panic and the contagions in order to go toward a central bank digital currency system. Could the fix be in? Is that possible? Only an open question. I didn't answer it. I'm merely asking it. Well, let's go through a few slides here and we'll explore it just a little bit. This one out of LifeSite News, Federal Reserve announces July 2023 launch of central bank digital currency infrastructure. So things appear to be moving along. A subhead, sub headline, a financial expert has warned that FedNow, which is a new service, lays out the foundation for a central bank digital currency by centralizing all participating banks under the Federal Reserve. Now, moving on from there, uh, we'll read into it just a little. The Federal Reserve on Wednesday, this is a March 17 article, so Wednesday was March 15, announced a July 2023 launch of its FedNow service which will enable all U.S. banks to offer instant payments 24-7 around the clock and will constitute the infrastructure of a central bank digital currency by linking each bank node directly to the Fed. According to financial experts, FedNow will enable all the banks, any bank in the U.S., not just the big ones, to offer instantly available funds and real-time payments to their customers, explained Fed Chair Jerome Powell, Speaking before the House uh, Financial Services Committee on March 8th, that's formerly the House Banking Committee. It's now called the Financial Services Committee. And going on from there, uh, picking out some things here. Uh, while the Federal Reserve Vice Chair Leo Brenner maintained during a House of Representatives Committee on Financial Services hearing in May that a central bank digital currency could take five years to launch due to needed security and design features, she added that Fed now will still serve many of the same functions as a central bank digital currency, according to the financial uh, news outlet. And moving on from there, financial advisor Joe Brown, uh, I was on the previous one, financial uh, advisor Joe Brown has warned that FedNow, that new service, serves as the foundation or infrastructure for a central bank digital currency, bringing the country only a step away from deployment of such a currency, the, the digital one, once the FedNow system is fully functioning, uh, Mr. Brown added this financial advisor, this infrastructure bypasses a lot of the need for the current banking infrastructure, which is the purpose of a central bank digital currency. And from there, we can keep going. Uh, eventually, every single economic participant has an account directly with the Federal Reserve, the central bank, and then you don't need any of the decentralized nodes of the financial system the, pre, the previously existing banks. The advisor, Mr. Brown, said this transforms the purpose of the entire banking system. It would centralize everything under one roof. And the only thing that would be left to do would be to have everybody open an account directly with the Federal Reserve. 
Now, that's pretty profound, even, even just in theory, even just because it's conceivable. And uh, so it's also instructive to look at previous panics on this side of the pond. Uh, the U.S. had uh, depressions in 1873 or panics, 1873, 1890, 1893. 1873 was considered the original Great Depression. Then, then came the uh, crash of 29. That became the actual Great Depression, 2008, a little bit less of a ripple in 2013, and then now the big question mark. These are all these panics, many of which, not all, but many of which brought along major changes. The 1907 and 1893 panics were cited as the main rationales for creating the Federal Reserve System in the first place, I might add. And then this is, uh, uh, maybe at this point you guys would want to comment. I've got just a couple more slides. Anything you guys want to add? David? Sorry, you're, we can't hear. Well, I can keep going. Yeah, go ahead. We're not sure what happened there. But anyway. Yeah. This is from the Yale School of Management, um, and this goes along again with the same um, working theory I had in mind since last week. Is the collapse of Silicon Valley Bank the start of a banking panic? Because if if some of this could be geared toward justifying a central bank digital currency, it has to be called a panic. It has to be actually defined as that. While Yale Insights says Silicon Valley Bank, a financial hub for tech startups, failed and was seized by regulators this week, Professor Andrew Metric, who has studied past financial crises, explains how SVB's balance sheet got squeezed and how the risks of other banks experiencing similar losses could constrain the Fed's future decisions. He also warned that concern about bank solvency is a risk in its own right. And going on from there, uh, it says in that article, the fundamental mismatch in the maturity of bank assets and liabilities, which is the very nature of banking itself, means that we are always at some risk. Banking panics have happened at regular intervals for hundreds of years. That's interesting. While the specific causes vary, the common theme is that panics occur when there's a legitimate concern about bank solvency. The FDIC recently reported that there are about $620 billion of unrealized losses currently at banks. 620 billion of unrealized losses. That's a lot. If interest rates continue to rise, then those asset values will fall even more. That's a consequence of higher rates. And if the economy goes into recession, that would be another blow to both sides of the banning, of the balance sheet, excuse me. And liabilities are generally deposits and assets are like loans and long-term government bonds, things like that. But um, moving on from there, um, we also have Off Guardian, and now it's upping the ante. The Silicon Valley Bank collapse, how financial crisis boosts the rise of central bank digital currencies. So now we see that connection being made between panics and crisis and um, contagions and the actual creation, or at least the rationale for the creation of central bank digital currencies. And this Off Guardian piece adds does that mean the collapses were planned and engineered to the last detail? Maybe, maybe not. Certainly, there was at least some warning for the people in the know. SBB CEO and CFOs, the, the bank's CEO and CFO, that is, dumped a combined $4 billion in stock in the two weeks before the crash, and Bilderberger Peter Thiel's Founders Fund withdrew all of its fr funds from SBB the Thursday before the collapse, according to Off Guardian, anyway. That is despite the California Department of Financial Protection and Innovation finding that Silicon Valley Bank was a, quote, sound financial institution as late as March 9th, and that it only entered insolvency after investors caused a run. So there's some allegedly suspicious things going on here. Uh, there's also some things that concerned um, Israel and early withdrawals. I don't have that at my fingertips. And moving on, in January this year, the World Economic Forum published a paper titled, Can Central Bank Digital Currencies Help Stabilize Global Financial Markets? And this article opined, it's clear what the sales pitch is going to be, but more than that, it's possible that bank runs will eventually 
or actually be encouraged in the future because they could increase the uptake of digital currency. According to a report from the Bank for International Settlements, emphasis added, uh, during a systemic banking crisis, transfers from bank deposits into central bank digital currencies would face lower transaction costs than those associated with cash withdrawals and would provide a safe haven destination in the form of the central bank. The lower costs of running to a central bank digital currency compared to cash imply that more depositors would quickly withdraw at a lower perceived probability of a system-wide bank, bank solvency crisis they argue that since any hypothetical central bank digital currency will be more secure than traditional bank deposits and it's easy and are easier to get than cash, then people would opt to use it in the in the event of a run on the bank and, and so on and so forth. And uh, we're, we're summarizing here. This is about the end of this. Once the central bank digital currencies are out there, op optional at first, of course, not not required, but optional. The central banks could theoretically increase the uptake by artificially engineering financial instability and causing regional banks to collapse. They won't. They won't make. They won't make it mandatory. And this goes into what David was saying. They'll just make it safe. All that matters is safe. And another report published in 2022 by the UK's House of Lords described central bank digital currencies as the solution in search of a problem. And this article concludes. It looks like they just found their problem. So yeah. what I thought about since last week's report, at least there's some preliminary indication that other people are thinking this way and that it could be conceivably heading this direction. Yes. OK, well, thank you for that, Mark. Now, of course, uh, uh, David, uh, the question is, uh, are central banks safe? We've already suggested that the Swiss National Bank isn't in such a safe position. Uh, but in the meantime, the Federal Reserve, uh, if I remember rightly, for most of the last year was attempting to wind back its quantitative easing program. Uh, you're muted, David. Hold on. Try again. No, no. Yeah, Go well, ahead. I'm not muted here. You okay? Go ahead. Right. So can you hear me? Yes. Hello, hello. Right. OK. Um, so the, this is the graph we showed last week. So this is the, the total assets of the Federal Reserve. It's a very interesting graph. It took them from, 20, from 1913 to 2009 to get to a billion. Um, they put an, an extra billion on the balance sheet uh, instantaneously to, to cope with the 2008-2009 banking crisis, um, mortgage crisis. Another billion went on by 2011, another billion and a half up to 2015. And then they started to, it went flat, and then they started to actually take money out of the system. They were genuinely tightening. And of course, what happened? They broke the banking system. We had the repo crisis of 2019, and they immediately reversed and started to create money again. We then had COVID, three trillion created essentially overnight, and then another two trillion to help recover from the effects of COVID. So, so they were up at nearly nine trillion. And then they were genuinely tightening again albeit by only about 600 billion, but they managed to do that. Um, how is that going now? Well, not well. So this is the chart from, well, actually last Wednesday. So how bad it is now is anybody's guess. But we see there about a year's worth of quantitative tightening where they took $600 billion off their balance sheet. Well, half of it's gone back on in a week since uh, the collapse of... Um, uh, of Silicon Valley Bank. Now, um, um, Mark was describing there the the losses um, I, I'm in the American banking system. Right, they mentioned six hundred and twenty billion, um, and that's that's the figure that's shown here on this chart from the Financial Times. We showed this last week as well. But this is, of course, their losses on the security portfolio. This is government debt and mortgage-backed securities. This is the best assets they have that they've lost $620 billion on. And that did beg the question, if this is the good stuff, what's the rest like? Um, well, we now know, because we've got uh, the Financial Times reporting here, the US banking system is more fragile than you'd think. They say academia isn't famous for churning out timely papers of practical value, 
but occasionally a gem emerged. And they've got an, um, an abstract from a research paper from the University of Southern California, Northwest University, Columbia, Stanford, and NBER. Now, what does it say? It said, well, we analyze US banks' asset exposure um, to the recent rise in interest rates with implications financial, for financial stability. Now, remember, the, the Fed are tightening, they're putting up interest rates to fight inflation, and they're breaking things. Um, so they say the US banking system's market value of assets is two trillion, not 620 billion, two trillion dollars lower than suggested by their book value. Uh, mark to market bank assets have declined by an average of 10% across all the banks, with the bottom fifth percentile experiencing a decline of 20%. Uh, and they say that 10% of banks have larger unrecognized losses than those in SVB. SVB was not the worst capitalized bank, and 10% of banks have got lower capitalization um, than Silicon Valley Bank. So it is much more uh, on the edge than you might think. 620 billion was the losses on their on the, the United States Treasury and mortgage-backed securities portfolio. But if you add the rest of their book to it, their loan book, they are underwater to the tune of two trillion. But that's not the full picture, because of course, what we then come on to, David, is uh, uh, derivatives, and uh, we haven't really mentioned this in detail yet. Now, derivatives, well, derivatives are basically, uh, oh, uh, derivatives are basically uh, a, a side bet on something that's real. Let's just put it that way. And there's two main categories of derivatives. The first is exchange traded derivatives. Now, exchange, derivatives that are uh, traded on some kind of exchange, uh, are like the stock exchange, are uh, they're visible. You know what sort of size they are. You know how who's taking part in the in the trade, uh, and you know what the likely outcome is going to be. But then you've got another type of derivatives on top of that called over-the-counter uh, derivatives, and these are traded uh, basically between two counterparties without ever going through an exchange. Uh, and well, you might say that it's equivalent to uh, walking up to some guy in the street and saying you want to have a bet on a horse. Uh, if you actually go to a casino or a betting shop and have your make your bets there, there are table limits. You, there are some rules involved uh, with this, with uh, the over the counter derivatives, just like as if you went up to the somebody uh, that's holding a book in the middle of the street. Uh, well, basically, he makes up the rules and you agree the rules, uh, and it's all pretty opaque. You don't really know the size, uh, and so there are many many estimates for the this sort of quantity. Uh, the, the monetary quantity of derivatives that are, are out there, uh, something up to the region of two quadrillion dollars. Now, of course, that's the value, the face value of these, and it all depends how those contracts uh, deal with the, the, each other as they uh, come to their uh, fruition, as it were. But just to give an idea of the exposure of the banks that people are aware of to these, uh, let's have a look at some of this. So JP Morgan Chase, uh, they have $54.3 trillion worth of derivatives on their books uh, and $3.3 .3 trillion of assets. That's 16 to 1 uh, ratio. Goldman Sachs, $51 trillion in derivatives against $0.5 trillion in assets. That's 99 to 1 or so uh, ratio. Uh, Citibank, $46 trillion in derivatives uh, and $1.7 trillion in assets, uh, 27 to 1 ratio. Uh, Bank of America, 21.6 trillion in derivatives uh, and 2.4 trillion in assets. That's only nine to one. Uh, what was the state of Credit Suisse? And maybe this gives us a clue why uh, this bank was considered too big to fail. So it had uh, $16.1 trillion in derivatives against uh, 0.57 trillion in assets. That was before the, the, uh, the various interventions. Um, and that was a 28 to one ratio. So, um, David, I don't know what your thoughts are on this, but bearing in mind so much of the derivatives market is utterly opaque, nobody gets to see uh, who's de doing deals with whom exactly, uh, and we don't actually know whether in the event of a bank failure uh, and one of the dominoes collapsing, whether the other dominoes would collapse in an orderly way. Uh, the, it just it gets to the point very, very quickly where it is unsavable. Yes, and, and this, this looks at the issue of risk because 
how does it all interact? I mean, one would have hoped that there's, there's some clever people in banks looking at the risk, but what did Silicon Valley Bank show? Even in very obvious risks, like the value of the assets they're holding going down and down and down, um, and them becoming less and less liquid, which means that the bank was ever more vulnerable to a bank run, even that risk, they couldn't foresee. So with this massive and opaque system, um, you know, what, what sort of risks are they running? Um, it, it, and and what, does, what does central bank policy do to it? As central banks move infra, interest rates around, they go from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. What is it triggering in the derivatives market? I mean, I have no idea. I, I, and I'm not sure if they do either. No, I don't think anybody does. But let's, let's bring this on screen then. This is a, an article uh, on Seeking Alpha. Uh, is your bank safe from a Credit Suisse collapse? Uh, Credit Suisse's notional amount of derivatives is uh, 15 trillion uh, Swiss francs, $16.1 trillion, which is almost 70% of the total US GDP. Yes, this is a notional amount, and after netting, it becomes much smaller. So that's assuming you can actually uh, deal with these derivatives in an orderly way, uh, that, that that number would become much smaller. Uh, but it goes on, uh, however, the majority of these derivatives are, over, derivatives are over the counter contracts, which are the riskiest type of derivatives, especially in a recessionary environment. Uh, when there's a high chance of a counterparty default risk. So that is that your counterparty uh, defaults on the money that they owe you. Uh, as a high, It is highly likely that uh, Credit Suisse is among derivative counterparties of large US banks, large UK banks as well. And in a crisis scenario, CS uh, likely would not be able to meet its obligations under these OTC contracts. Uh, this would lead to major losses for US banks and eventually for the retail depositors. Bottom line, we believe derivatives exposure is one of the key risks for a bank in a volatile environment, since there is a high chance of a counterparty default risk. So uh, we should not underestimate uh, just the state of not just the obvious uh, aspects of the financial system that we can see. For example, $17 billion of bond losses for uh, uh, people that were invested in Credit Suisse, uh, but actually all the worthless paper that's out there that, uh, that actually is totally invisible to the majority of people. Uh, but David, let's uh, move on then to uh, money creation. Interesting, if inaccurately named paper by the Bank of England. So this is this is the Bank of England coming somewhat clean on what the banking system is. Now, they, they call it money creation in the modern economy. Uh, they actually mean currency creation. They're not creating money, they're creating currency. We'll maybe talk about that more in extra time. And all through this, there are bits of spin, the way they use language, what they look at, what they don't. But even though there is some manipulation in this paper, it does provide quite an interesting read. So it talks about um, how lending creates deposits, right? And it's got, they're calling this broad money. Uh, so they're saying... Um, Broad money is made up of bank deposits, essentially IOUs from commercial banks to households and companies, and currency, which is IOUs from the central bank. Of these two types, broad money, bank deposits make up almost all, 97%. And in the modern economy, those bank deposits are mostly created by the commercial banks themselves. So they go on to explain, commercial banks create money in the form of bank deposits by making new loans. When a bank makes a loan, uh, for example, someone taking out a mortgage to buy a house, it does not do so by giving them thousands of pounds worth of bank notes. Instead, it credits the bank account with a bank deposit of the same size as the mortgage. At that moment, new money is created, their emphasis. For this reason, some economists have referred to bank deposits as fountain pen money, created at the stroke of a banker's pen. Now, they then go on to explain how this works. So there's a little, um, a little diagram here, and it shows that at this point, the central bank's not doing anything. Um, that uh, in terms of the commercial banks, they are adding new loans to their asset uh, pile and the new deposits become additional liabilities um, for the bank. And in terms of the customers, those new deposits are their assets and the, and the loan agreement is their liability. Now, uh, I, I would just point out at, 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 this, at this juncture, 
uh, a lot of people wonder if banks can create money out of thin air, they just imagine it into existence, which is what happens. How can they ever go bust? And of course, the answer is, yeah, they're creating money, but they're not creating money, which is an asset. They're creating a liability. The asset is the loan agreement. And of course, if people default on the loans, the banks can indeed go bust. Uh, it then goes on to explain all of the statutory um, free market, free-ish market, and central bank constraints on what the what the commercial banks can actually do. There are a lot of constraints on what they can do. They're by no means free to operate without constraint. Um, and it then goes on. As the next diagram here shows um, uh, how uh, this inter how the interaction between um, more than one bank happens. So it looks at a case of someone buying a house. They get the loan. Um, the loan becomes um, a liability for the for the um, uh, for the house buyer, um, and he gets uh, the assets, and the, the new deposits created by the bank. Subsequently, he will buy the house. The house builder will deposit the the cash in another bank, and the bank that's made the loan has to cover that. So those that the bank that makes the loan has their reserves depleted. Right, so that's a limit on what that bank can do, and that's why the bank needs to have other people making deposits um, in, in, into the bank to to make up for that, so that the reserves are not entirely depleted. So this is um, this is one of the constraints as to what limits what how much banks can can create, um, and uh, the um, and it does require banks to get. Um, to, to have people deposit cash as well, but it's not as straightforward as the deposit cash becomes a loan cash. It's much more indirect than that. And the, the final thing I'll cover from this, this paper is they talk a little bit about how quantitative easing works, which is also very strange and obscure. So quantitative easing, um, the, uh, the, the central bank goes to non-bank actors, right, like pension funds that hold government debt. They buy the government debt, but they can't buy it directly because they can't interact with uh, non-bank actors. They can only interact with banks. These bank reserves are a kind of special bank-only style of currency. So what they do is there's a, res a, a correspondent bank that, that is the bank of, of the um, pension fund, uh, and the, the, gov the central bank makes a... Uh, increases that that commercial bank's reserves, and in return, that commercial bank creates the deposits. All right, so you then end up with a situation that the central bank holds the government debt and more reserves uh, from the commercial banking system. The commercial banking system has more liabilities, right? More more uh, money on deposit from, in this case, the pension fund, but also more reserves. So there, so the so the actual money supply is expanded, but it's it's almost neutral for the banking system. But of course, the key point there is the liabilities of the central bank, the reserves, are going up and up and up. And as interest rates have gone up, that has started to really tell. That's why the Bank of England is something like 200 billion in the red because of the interest payments going out on those. Um, uh, on those liabilities, on those uh, reserves, uh, compared to the very small interest rate it's getting in from the debt that it bought. Okay, thanks for that. Any thoughts? Yes, but we'll save those for extra, extra time. Okay. Okay, let's move on then. And uh, that, well, President Xi Jinping is uh, in Moscow to meet uh, Vladimir Putin. Uh, and well, the BBC was going a bit uh, nuts about that earlier on today. Uh, but let's just uh, have a look at what uh, the Chinese are saying about this. Uh, they are viewing this as a very positive development, and we'll come on to whether it is in a second or not. But this is this was what they were uh, really seeing as the outcome from this meeting. They're looking for a mature and tenacious Sino-Russian relationship, uh, which will effectively promote the unity, development, and prosperity of the Eurasian continent, bring together forces to jointly safeguard the norms of international relations and strengthen mutually beneficial cooperation. 
inject strong positive energy into the complication, complicated international situation and make new contributions to building a community with a shared future from, for mankind. Now, that's uh, what they are certainly saying about this meeting uh, today, but uh, the West not so happy about it, as we'll hear in a second. Uh, now, of course, uh, the Chinese have already brokered a peace deal in recent weeks, uh, as we mentioned a couple of days ago, with uh, uh, Russia, with uh, uh, Iran and uh, thank you, uh, with Iran and Saudi Arabia, uh, and that's quite incredible. But also uh, lots of other stuff going on in the background here. Uh, so uh, let's just bring uh, President Assad on. He was visiting uh, the United Arab Emirates uh, over the weekend, um, and uh, so this again with all this Russian and uh, Chinese influence in the background uh, has allowed this to happen. So we seem to be seeing a restructuring of relationships within the Middle East, uh, Syria being, br being brought back on stream and so on. But in the meantime, China uh, continuing to offer uh, to uh, try to negotiate some kind of peace in Ukraine. Uh, this is not going down so well in the United States. Um, so let's just uh, bring this little clip on screen. Hey, uh, that if coming out of this meeting, there's some sort of call for a ceasefire. Well, that's just going to be unacceptable because all that's going to do, Mike, is ratify Russia's conquest to date. All that's going to do is give Mr. Putin more time to refit, retrain, reman, uh, and try to, uh, to, to plan for, for renewed off offensives at a time of his choosing. Uh, we hope and we've said this before, that, Mr. that President Xi will call and talk to President Zelensky because we believe the Chinese need to get the Ukrainian perspective here. Mm -hmm. So that was John Kirby, the National Security Advisor, clearly deeply unhappy uh, of any potential uh, meeting with, uh, between Xi and, and uh, Putin, resulting in some kind of effort towards peace. That would be the last thing we want, Brian. Uh, well, we certainly, <laughs> yeah, we certainly don't want peace because the money is all in the uh, war. Let's remember at the end of the day that the war in Ukraine or any other war doesn't take place without the bankers and the arms industry getting a big cut. But um, I was fascinated by two articles for the BBC today. Um, I read one after the other. I went back to the first one. I read the second one again. And I thought, my goodness, we've got the BBC literally falling apart here because what you can see, or I believe you can see in the two articles, is pure cognitive dissonance by the BBC reporters. So this is the first article, two decades on how the UK-US-led invasion turbocharged Iraq into chaos. Well, when you get into the article, it's not talking about chaos, it's talking about rape, murder, torture, genocide, but uh, okay, we'll go with the headline. And the second one was this one, um, the uh, Z Putin meeting, what to expect from China-Russia talks. So let's go back to the first one, which uh, was written by BBC journalist Jeremy Bowen. And these are some of the comments from the article. By the time IS rampaged through Iraq in the summer of 2014, the US and the UK had ended their occupation. Jihadist ideology existed long before the invasion and had inspired the 9-11 attacks. And I'm just gonna put a label on here. So basically, the US and the UK leave Iraq destroyed and in the hands of rape, torture and genocide. He went on, he said, it's a grim irony that the invasion has dropped out of political and public debate in the US, which conceived and led it. And in the UK, its closest ally in the coalition, the Americans and British bear a heavy responsibility for what happened after the invasion and its consequences also affect them. So we'll put in the label, the US and UK share responsibility for what happened in Iraq after the invasion. Here we go with the next one. Iraq's, ty Iraq's tyrant, Saddam Hussein, was well worth overthrowing. He had imprisoned and killed thousands of Iraqis, even using chemical weapons against rebellious Kurds. The problem was how it was done, the way the US and the UK ignored international law. This is an amazing piece by a BBC journalist. We'll read that again. The problem was how it was done, the way the US and UK ignored international law and the violence that gripped Iraq after the Bush administration failed to make a plan to fill the power vacuum created by the regime change. Regime change, which of course the US and the British had um, 
constructed and achieved. So here we are, the US and UK ignored international law. 12 years later, by 2003, America's rage and arrogance of power blinded the second President Bush to the realities that had constrained his father. When the US and UK could not persuade the UN Security Council to pass a resolution explicitly authorizing invasion and regime change, Mrs. Uh, Mrs. Bush and Blair claimed earlier resolutions gave them the authority they needed. So let's put in our label, America's rage and arrogance of power was unleashed. They gave themselves their own power. And here among Many who did not buy their argument was the UN Secretary General Kofi Annan. In a BBC interview 18 months after the invasion, he said it was not in conformity with the UN Charter. In other words, illegal. France and other NATO allies refused to join the invasion. Tony Blair ignored huge protests in the UK. His decision to go to war dogged the rest of his political career. So we're going to label that that the US and the UK criminally broke international law. And I think this article has set it out very clearly. So we're going to say unusually well done, Jeremy Bowen. So let's come in and have a look at uh, what the BBC has to say when it's Russia and China. And here's the journalist, Steve Rosenberg. So Putin's looking for allies and trying to make Russia part of a common fortress with China as well as, as well as with India and some parts of Latin America and Africa, Putin is building his anti-Western world. So the US and the UK can do as they please to build the Western world, but Russia and China cannot. He goes on, war has become the organizing principle of Russian domestic politics, foreign policy and economic policy. There is an obsession with destroying uh, Ukraine. Now, the quote is actually coming from Alex uh, Muratov here, but uh, the point is it's in Rosenberg's article. So the US and UK can wage war as they please, but Russia and China cannot. Uh, President Xi once called President Putin his best friend. The two have much in common. They're both authoritarian leaders and both embrace the idea of a, multi sorry, a multipolar world devoid of US domination. So what we're saying is that US domination of the world is good, uh, but a Russian Chinese multipolar world is bad. Uh, so just to clarify, that's what they're saying. <laughs> yeah, yes, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. So if we look at those two articles together, quite incredible cognitive dissonance by the BBC that now the truth is really doing some damage in this despicable propaganda machine because their own journalists are now showing that they can't really keep tabs on what's reality. So I'll leave, leave our viewers to think about this, but I thought the article on Iraq particularly good. Uh, okay, if you like what the UK column does, you would like to support us, please head over to community.ukcolumn.org. Uh, there are options to help us out and uh, we will uh, be uh, discussing this in a bit more detail in Extra. Uh, to begin with, uh, then if you'd like to pick something up in uh, at the UK Column shop, uh, then please do. Uh, but in any case, do share uh, any material you very find on the various platforms. OK, well, a quick um, uh, plug for the UK Column here. This was um, a Twitter exchange. Um, so a Dr. Simon Goddick was saying these people have been right since the beginning. The struggle against the Great Reset and the Fourth Industrial Revolution over the past three years has been exhausting. What's over, often overlooked is that we started as a small group of resistance fighters. And uh, underneath, um, somebody has said UK column deserve full recognition for their accurate coverage from the start. And B Lady says completely agree. And um, thank you very much for the person who sent this through. But it's obvious if we look across quite a lot of social media now, people are picking up on the UK column. So that's very positive. Right, let's uh, just do a little bit of an overview of what's happening in uh, Ukraine. And of course, there's been a, an escalation in the fighting across all of the fronts over the weekend. I'll take you through this as quickly as I can. But I would like to say once again, I could only do this due to the good work of many other uh, researchers who are kind enough to post their work on social media. So um, a, 
A story which is out there is that there have been Ukrainian attacks over the weekend. They have occurred mainly on the southern sector, Saporozhia front. And if we really analyze these, these are reconnaissance miss missions uh, with a few armored vehicles, two or three, and a few relatively small number of troops that are attacking along the line to probe the uh, Russian position. So we can't say that this is a full-scale attack. These are probing attacks that the Ukrainians are being carried out in a variety of places. But of course, Zelensky has told the world that there will be a Ukrainian offensive um, to try and push through to Mariupol and retake the Crimea. This will be interesting to watch. Uh, Rybar is a pro-Russian source, but put out a very good uh, update on what was happening. So it's talking about Ukrainian air assaults uh, being reinforced and repulsed. I'll leave people to freeze the screen to have a look at these. Um, they're talking about armored vehicles from the uh, Ukrainians uh, trying to be highly mobile on the battlefield, but this is very difficult because it's still very muddy. But it's very clear that there have been a number of these attacks to test the Russian defenses, and you can read about it here. And uh, ultimately, Rybar says the Ukrainian command is preparing for a large scale offensive. Regular, essentially suicidal attacks are aimed at assessing the state of Russian defences and adjusting the overall offensive plan in the Zaporozhia region. And this is really the meat of it because the movement of small numbers of troops uh, are invariably resulting in those troops being killed, usually by shelling by the Russians. But uh, in bigger areas of the front uh, of Divka, we've, mo we've mentioned before, this is another fortified city which the Russians have encircled. And uh, a report here from Il Russo, this is pro-Russian, but he's been quite accurate. He's now saying that Russian forces are entering the southwestern sector of the city itself. But this report is unconfirmed at the moment. In Bakhmut, um, Bakhmut is encircled. The one remaining road is, is virtually impossible. But what was interesting by this analysis by Weeb Union is that the, um, the bordered areas that you can see around Bakhmut city show the small sections that the Russian forces take at a time. They're not storming the city in one go. They are eating their way into it, and they're doing this because it reduces Russian casualties and increases Ukrainian casualties by the shelling. These two videos give us a, uh, an idea of the state of the roads. I don't know where these two tanks are stuck in the, in the mud, but I suspect it is the Bakhmut area. Uh, but if you look at it, you can see the reason why the Ukrainians are in dire straits, uh, because if it is an unmetalled road, it's virtually impassable. And uh, these tanks can't even uh, pull one of their own out. If I go to this video, um, I, am, I believe that this is the sole remaining escape road from Bakhmud. It's littered with destroyed vehicles because beg your pardon for that, because even that road is under fire control by the Russians. This is the reality in Bakhmud and in the southwest of this uh, south southwest of the city and in the north, the Russian forces are closing the pincer movement. And uh, in this report by Defence Politics Asia, you can see that the Russians are using this pincer movement tactic tactically in the city as well as outside the city. So if we put a bit more meat on that, this uh, map shows the sheer scale of the Russian uh, territory around Bakhmud. Um, so Bakhmud is now being swallowed into Russian-held territory. Uh, but what's happening is the Russians are pushing these pincers in, uh, in the position of the red arrows, but they're also now aiming for these fortified cities, uh, fortified urban areas of Chasivyar and Ivaniska. And uh, the reality is that the Russians will take these. So we wait to see how, how long, uh, because the objective is always to go slow, to kill the, to kill the Ukrainians by shell fire. 
And I'll just leave this subject by the fact that uh, the BBC gloating that uh, Poland and Slovakia have pledged a handful of MiG-29s to Ukraine. Uh, but the reality is that Ukraine's got no viable air force left. It has no viable air defense. Uh, any air base anywhere in Ukraine can be hit by Russian missiles. While Russia has a powerful combat experienced air force, the strongest air defense systems in the world, and an eye-watering electronic warfare capability. So there's no doubt that those planes are going to be destroyed. And, um, and we should just mention, of course, that was Ben Wallace's idea. He was determined that anybody in, within NATO that still had uh, uh, MiG aircraft uh, should donate those to uh, Ukraine. Yes, and of course, there will be no um, F-16s going because the F-16 is a very delicate aircraft. It can't operate from forward air bases. And of course, the Americans are desperately worried that they will be shot down. And that will be another blow to the... Uh, the U.S. defense industry. 